when you are fully present with a child, and it doesn't have to be for three hours, it can be for a half an hour, you are giving them the message that they are enjoyable to be with. And that's something that they need to experience. They don't just need to hear it from you because we can say to kids, oh, I'm sure that all the kids would love to play with you. Or if you go up to somebody on the playground and ask if you want to play, I'm sure they'll include you. We can say that stuff, but let's give them the experience of you really valuing them. This is why other relatives are so important. This is why grandparents that think their children are amazing are so important for a kid's sense of value and a sense of of worth. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Hey, Lynn. Hey, Robin. So let me just tell you, I was talking to a mom the other day who said to me, I'm having a really hard time because my daughter is lonely and she is just crying to me, sobbing to me, saying that she just wishes she had more friends. Oh, and I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I have been a therapist for 33 years and I have helped people through all sorts of horrible, horrible things. And there's nothing that pierces my therapist heart than when I am dealing with somebody who talks about being lonely. It's just so, so sad to me. It's just so heavy to me. So we're going to talk about loneliness today because unfortunately, It is not at all uncommon, in fact, becoming ever more common for people of all ages to experience loneliness. But I bet there's something we can do about it. There is something we can do about it, for sure. Is there like a therapist definition of loneliness? Well, I mean, there's a therapist definition, but I think really, I always try and look for the definitions of the people that are getting the information about it. I want to look at the research definition because they have a very good way of sort of describing it and putting words to it. And the way that the researchers look at loneliness is that it really is this gap between what you want in your social connection, in your relationships, and what you perceive you have. So loneliness isn't being alone. Like there are some people who are really fine, like they would rather just hang out by themselves after work, or they only want one friend to do things, or they're totally fine with staying home on a Sunday and reading a book by themselves. And that feels really rejuvenating or replenishing to them. Those people we wouldn't say are lonely. It is a longing, basically. It is a feeling of missing out and wishing for something that you don't have and often being very confused as to why you can't get it and how you go about getting it. It sounds like what you're also saying, we've talked about it in different language on other episodes. It sounds like when you know you are lacking the connection you seek. Correct. When you know you're lacking the connection you seek. Yeah. So you're right. You're remembering how often I talk about sort of the path of anxiety into depression. And a lot of that has to do with that recognition during adolescence when connection is so important that recognition of not having the connection that you see other people have or that you perceive other people have. The other thing that lonely people do is they don't really get or nobody has really taught them or they don't really understand that connection takes work and that it's an active process. So a lot of times when people are lonely, They look at other people and they say, it's so easy for them. Like, look, they can do it without even having to try. And they themselves feel like, why isn't it so easy for me? You know, when we were talking about repetitive negative thinking, one of the things that's interesting about that is that people who worry and ruminate, they tend to not take helpful advice when it's offered, which is sort of an interesting thing. Like they're like, oh, I'm so stuck in this problem. And then somebody says, well, do this. And they're like, no, no, no. I'm just going to stay stuck in this problem. That's what worriers and ruminators do. Ooh, that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Well, it's why it becomes so frustrating. 
Yeah. But when people are lonely, there's sort of a similar thing that happens is that the research shows that people are lonely tend to be more self-focused and less responsive to others. So if somebody makes an overture toward you to sort of be included or to join, lonely people, people who define themselves as lonely, are generally not responsive, as responsive when other people reach out, which is kind of interesting. But it's something that I see in kids a lot. And this is where parents will be like, nobody wants to be friends with my child at school. And then the school counsel will say like, well, I went out and observed and a lot of kids came up and tried to engage your child and your child didn't respond or your child sort of brushed off the invitation. And that's something interesting that we see with people who experience loneliness. It sounds like what you're going to be talking about is that there are both patterns that are common among people who are experiencing loneliness and then skills that they need to strengthen. But I do want to ask, and just for clarity, loneliness can happen to someone They move schools, they move. Other things could happen where someone who actually does have maybe those skills, they're in a situation, right, where there's just not a lot of connection opportunity as well. So it's thinking of it not as a permanent thing. Correct. And so oftentimes it's sort of like the way we look at grief and depression, the way we look at certain mood states is that when somebody is more chronically lonely, it tends to be more of an internal problem because they're in a more internally focused state. But there's also what you refer to is situational loneliness, where you move to a new state, you change schools, you're in a job, you can't really find your tribe. The other thing to know about loneliness, and this is something that is kind of different than when we look at the statistics about anxiety, because anxiety cuts across all socioeconomic groups and all sorts of different types of people. But the research does show that if you are in a unrepresented or an underrepresented class, particularly racial groups, you're more likely to be lonely. So in this country, Hispanic adults, African-American, Black adults are classified as more lonely than we see among the total adult population. Your income makes a difference. So lower income people tend to report higher rates of loneliness. And what was really interesting in terms of, of the research is that young adults are twice as likely to be lonely as seniors in this country. And I've talked about that before. So if you are between the ages of 18 to 24, the level of loneliness that you're feeling is twice what people aged 66 and older are feeling. That's a pretty sad stat because I think of the senior population's loneliness being kind of a crisis. So that leads me to believe then that the young adults are not having an easy time. They are not having an easy time. And in fact, the senior people report levels of loneliness that's significantly less than young adults. And I think it is sort of this idea that we have that people are old and lonely. That's not what the research bears out. The other thing, too, that's important is that the one place where there wasn't a difference when they looked at loneliness was between men and women. Men and women report almost equal levels of loneliness on average when we compare in that way, which is interesting because sometimes you would say, well, women are more social and they seek out support more and they tend to talk to their friends more. And men, typically, if we stereotype them, tend to be more withholding or tend to be more solitary. And that doesn't come out in the research. I just want to preview that we're going to be talking about loneliness in a two-part episode. Mm -hmm. So this episode, we're going to focus on kids and teens. Next week's episode, Lynn and I are going to talk about adults and loneliness. Yes, we are. How do you assess whether or not your children or teenagers might be lonely if they don't volunteer that information to you? Well, one of the things that parents see a lot is that they're not seeing their children have social connection. They're not seeing their kids involved in activities. They're seeing their children spend a lot of time alone. And when they ask their kids about it, you may get, you know, hey, is there anybody that you can call? Do you want to have some people over? Is there an activity that you want to participate in? 
instead of saying like, no, I'm good on my own, they'll be like, well, I don't really know. Or I don't think anybody would want to come and play with me. Because remember, if you are chronically lonely, if it's not situational, you really have a perception that everybody else is having a good time and you're not included. If you have a child and you ask them about friends or what's going on, and they say, I wish I had more friends, or I wish I had somebody to play with, or nobody wants to play with me, that's the way they talk about loneliness. Yeah. I read once that when a child says to their parent, would you like to play with me or will you play with me? We have to hear that as I'm lonely and seeking connection. Correct. Yeah. I know. And I also saw something that made me feel verklempt, which it said that when kids say to parents, will you play with me? The other thing that they're saying is, I just had a really rough day. Like you're saying, I'm seeking connection. A third grader doesn't come home after a tough day at school when maybe they've been teased or they've been ostracized in some way. They don't come home and say, gosh, today was really emotionally draining. They say, will you play with me? Right. Okay. So we're easy criers. We'll have a moment of tears amongst ourselves (laughs) and take a quick break. (laughs) All right. Uh, Robin, I don't love grocery shopping. I know you don't. I'll tell you. Thrive Market This is a way to get all of my grocery and household essentials without having to go to the grocery store. It is so convenient. It gets shipped right to my doorstep. For example, my seventh generation cleaning products right there. Well, as a Thrive Market member, you can save money on every single order on average, and I save 30% each time. Wow, that's amazing. On top of the massive savings on each order, Thrive Market has a deals page that changes daily. You can get cash back on so many brands and they have a price match guarantee. I love the deals page. I love the filters on their website and they have an app where you can go and look for certified gluten-free snacks, non-toxic cleaning essentials. You can curate your own shopping experience with a click of a button. When you join Thrive Market, you're also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join they give. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. So go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks. Lynn, I love it when we have sponsors who do things differently. Fearless Finance provides on-demand, comprehensive financial planning by the hour, and it's a totally new way to get financial advice without all the headaches and high fees and commitments that come with traditional financial advisors. Yeah, and I think also a lot of people don't go see a financial advisor because they think, A, you're supposed to be really rich to do that. You have to have a lot of money. And also because it's so intimidating. And I think the goal of Fearless finance is, as they say, to just make it accessible to people who are in the stage of life when they're trying to figure all this stuff out. They specialize in families that are at the stage of accumulating their assets. Yeah. And the thing that's so different about them is that they don't manage assets. You keep your money where it is. There's no minimums. There's no worries about how much you've saved so far. They are focusing on holistic financial advice. That's right. They're not making commissions on anything, but this is a women owned business. All your financial meetings are virtual. It removes the intimidation factor. You don't have to commit to some long-term thing. You can give it a try. They charge by the hour. The smallest amount of time they charge is 15 minutes. So visit fearlessfinance.com today to get started. And you can chat with a planner for free to make sure it's a good fit. And you'll get $50 off your first planning meeting when you use the code FLUSTER. Yeah, so go visit fearlessfinance.com and use the code FLUSTER to get $50 off your first planning meeting. Okay, we're back. So Robin, now that we've bummed everybody out about how sad loneliness is and talked about the not so great statistics about loneliness, Which, by the way, 61% of adults reported being lonely in 2019, 
and 68% of adults reported being lonely in 2021 and 2022. So we're going to talk about adults in our next episode. But just so you know, it's a problem. If you're listening to this and you're saying like, oh my God, I'm lonely too. Ironically, you are in good company in your loneliness. Well, I think everyone feels it at some point or another. Oh, for sure. And I think it's great that you, I have a feeling you're about to give us some really great advice of how do we focus on prevention and the, not the treatment of loneliness, but the, I guess the solutions. Yeah. How to help. So there's a few things that you want to do as early as possible. And remember, I say the earlier, the better, but it's never too late. If you have a child that has difficulty with social skills, If you have a child that even their temperament, they're more introverted, they tend to be quieter, it's hard for them to initiate things, recognize that with that type of temperament, with that type of personality, it is really helpful for you to do two things. One is to help your child make social engagements and arrangements, which is something that we tend to do much more often when kids are little, but sometimes even as they get a little older and we back off from that. They're going to need help initiating those connections, and that's a perfectly fine thing for you to do. So what that often means is setting it up so that your child actually has more opportunities to bump into, to connect with, to circulate with kids that might be a part of their tribe. So kids that are lonely, sometimes they tend to be passive. So when you're chronically lonely, you tend to be passive. You tend to pull back. They might be resistant to joining activities or trying things. The more that you can have other kids around them, the better. So help that happen. Go to activities, go to playgrounds where there are lots of kids. If you are home by yourself, and your child is looking lonely or you know your child is lonely and you say, well, do you want to invite a friend over? Sometimes that feels too intense. If you're not good with social skills, right? So it's a little contradictory because sometimes kids that are anxious, socially anxious, they get overwhelmed when there's a lot of kids. But on the same token, a one-to-one play date can also feel a little too intense for a lonely kid to handle. We want to give them lots of opportunities to sort of circulate, so to speak, with other kids. So look for that. We also want to just very directly help them with social skills. Because when we see kids that are lonely, they often have difficulty making eye contact. They have difficulty keeping a conversation going. They have difficulty just knowing how to walk up to somebody and ask a question. So if you can talk to your child about that, pay attention to that. The other thing that you really need to pay attention to as a parent is that it's very likely that you might have the same issues because this is the way it works, right? Nature and nurture. So you want to pay attention to what you're modeling for your child. And maybe the two of you together can come up with a way to engage socially together And this is where this whole idea of doing meaningful work, volunteering, if they're old enough to get a part-time job, all of those experiences are not only practice for working on your social skills, but also give you opportunity to have more people around you that you might have things in common with. And that's really helpful for lonely people, lonely kids and adults, actually. I want to share. So, you know, my kids are younger than yours. So I had school kids during lockdown and distance learning and everything that your kids were in college, you know, and I had a son in elementary school. And so there was definitely a point where children were experiencing isolation more than usual. And during that remote phase, I remember talking with you about this actually in the early podcasts. Sometimes those peer connections are just hard because of situations, obviously like COVID and the pandemic, or you are at a new school and you actually don't know who to call, right? There are those things that can happen. And I think that this is the role where it's my belief that parents can play a role to help bridge that loneliness while the peer opportunities sort of reappear. So I don't want parents to feel like they don't have power here. And then this is what I would say, and I'd love to hear your take on this. 
when a parent knows they have a lonely child who needs connection, whether it's the, I came home and do you want to play with me? Or it's a slightly older child that you know needs connection. How do you walk that parent through that experience? Like, what are the tips so that we're truly giving real and offering real connection, not distracted connection? You know, as a parent, there's a big difference in kind of listening to your kid while you're still on your phone. (laughs) Yes. So talk us through that. Yeah. I often talk about this because I just think it is such a beautiful intervention that a colleague of mine, Mindy, does is that when you've got a child and often a teenager too, that's feeling lonely and feeling disconnected, even going so far as to say they're feeling depressed, one of the things that she has them do is she says, you guys have to go for a walk together for a half an hour, rain or shine, no devices. And even if you're just walking in silence, that's totally fine. But I want your child to experience you being completely committed to being in their presence, period. Because what lonely kids begin to wonder is what's wrong with them and why doesn't anybody want to enjoy my company? And so even if it's not going for a walk, she has that as a simple thing. And plus, it's good to get a depressed kid outside and and moving is oftentimes being able to say to a child, is there something you'd really love to do for a half an hour that I could do with you? Would you like to color? Would you like to play Legos? And it is so important. What you are doing in those moments is that even though your child is saying, I wish I had friends, you as one of the most important people in their lives, what you are saying to them is, I value your presence. I value your company. I value the time that we're going to spend together. And this is what lonely people really have a hard time believing about themselves, that other people want to spend time with them. They say to themselves, why does everybody else have this? And I don't. What's wrong with me? When a child says, I really want friends, translate that to, I don't know how to do this, mommy. And so when you are fully present with a child, and it doesn't have to be for three hours, it can be for a half an hour, you are giving them the message that they are enjoyable to be with. And that's something that they need to experience. They don't just need to hear it from you because we can say to kids, oh, I'm sure that all the kids would love to play with you. Or if you go up to somebody on the playground and ask if you want to play, I'm sure they'll include you. We can say that stuff, but let's give them the experience of you really valuing them. This is why other relatives are so important. This is why grandparents that think their children are amazing are so important for a kid's sense of value and a sense of of worth. As a parent, when I feel pretty spent after a work day and I know I need to connect, especially if I've been gone all day, sometimes I just still think that the simplest physical touch is such a great shortcut. So I will sit on the sofa, arm around my child, and then I will take my free hand and just hold it up to their hand and let's say, whose hand's bigger? Just like those little things or, and then it can evolve and whose foot's bigger? You know, you could keep going. So it's just this like simple moment on a sofa where you're giving them 100% of your attention. I think that's also medicinal for me. Of course. Yeah. So, and it really is what you said is a hundred percent of your attention because so much of our attention is split. So much of our attention is I'm going to sit here with you and you're going to watch a movie and I'm going to sit next to you, but I'm going to be on my phone, right? So it's finding those moments in which they have a hundred percent of your attention. You are showing them that you value and enjoy their presence. When you're lonely, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody who enjoys your presence, who's happy to see you. That's what makes us feel connected for sure. And I've worked from home with kids for more than a decade. So I totally get the, let's put on a show while I'm on my laptop. (laughs) Yes. So I have done that. And I like, so I'm not judging that because I had to do that. Well, and that's what I'm saying is that it's not 100% of your attention 100% of the time. Exactly. So it's like moments matter. Correct. And even just saying like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or a half an hour in which you are giving your child your full attention, right? Doesn't have to, because we have to do all the other things too. 
but it's cooking a meal together where you're standing side by side and chopping up the carrots and having a conversation. When you had teenage boys, since we were talking about younger kids, when you had teenage boys and you were thinking about this, what were some of the go-to strategies that you think works well for teens? Well, one of the rules that I had was that when they were in the car with me, they weren't allowed to be on their phone. Mm. Because we would drive up to my parents a lot and it's a 35 minute drive. So we had amazing conversations. We did a lot of reading aloud. So one of the best memories that I have of my kids is that when my boys were little were when all the Harry Potter books were coming out. And being together and snuggling up and reading aloud and the three of us being totally focused on this story that we were telling was just fabulous. I just loved it. My favorite. So I got to read part of the final book to your boys. And then there was as the drama kept building and building, they both go, I think we should stop now so that my mom takes over. Oh, that's so sweet. And then mom took over and I totally, at the end, I could hardly get out the last of it. I cried and they were like, why are you crying? And I was like, because there's a lot happening right now. Yeah. It was, <laughs> and also I was crying because this is ending. You know, this is coming to an end. Yeah. No, it was just, just great. I'm glad you clarified it was Harry Potter because I was trying to imagine since we were talking about teenagers, if, if you all read aloud when they were in high school <laughs> and what you would be reading. Yeah. But you know, there are some families that do that. I know there are couples that do that. Like they read aloud to each other at night. Yeah. No, I think reading aloud is awesome. Yeah. But not a lot of families do that after childhood. I know. Well, because also kids like to read by themselves because that's their time alone, right? They're sort of independent readers and they like that. Yeah. One more tip and then we can take a break because there's something really important that I want to talk about in the last chunk of this. I did a workshop with a huge group of educators, school counselors, teachers, administrators. It was really great. And this one guy came up to me afterwards and said, we have to be careful that we don't label little kids as shy because we were talking about how we'll say, oh, well, he's the rowdy one or he's the artistic one or he's the shy one. He said that he heard this thing from another mom where with a little toddler who was pretty shy, the mom would say, she's just not yet ready to say hello. I thought that was such a nice phrase. She's just not yet ready to say hello. Instead of saying like, oh, she's shy or she's quiet. And because it predicts, right? She's just not yet ready. She's going to figure it out, but give her a little bit of time. And so when we're talking about kids and we're trying to help them with their social skills and we're trying to help them connect so that we can get ahead of this loneliness thing, it really is important that we don't label kids in a certain category. Oh, this is my shy one. This is my quiet one. This is my introverted one. They hear those labels and they live up to them. Not that there's anything wrong with being an introverted, shy person, but when you're a little kid and you're still figuring things out, we don't want to be stuck with a label that might impede their ability or their willingness to step out of that role as it becomes more important. One other question about kids, if they also have both a, an internal pattern as well as external circumstances that make them a little less friend heavy. We've talked about the role that parents can have and really still giving them some real connection. These siblings, if it works that way, can do that too. What do you think about just thinking about the other kids in their lives who might not be students at that new school? Cousins Huge. Anytime that your child is interacting with other human beings in a positive way, it's filling up their bucket of connection. So it doesn't even matter. Like, say you volunteered at a food bank and you brought your 12 year old with you, and the other adults were interacting with your 12 year old, or say you said to the other parents, Hey, I'm going to bring my 12 year old. Can you bring yours? So, of course, Kids definitely want friends that can have their own relationships with and they can develop connection with. But anytime, if your child is struggling this way, anytime that they can have positive connection with other human beings, it fills up their bucket, right? Because remember, when people are lonely, it's an internal state and the conclusion they come to is what's wrong with me. And when you're around other people and they're enjoying your company and you're showing them this or you're singing along or doing whatever... It helps to diffuse that very powerful self-concept that that's what we want to do. I have a feeling what you want to talk about 
next is teens and social media and all of the technology that facilitates loneliness. Oh, yes, I do want to talk about that. So let's take a break. And then I have some things to say about that. So, Robin, a lot of people haven't really thought about this, but why do we have laundry detergent in big plastic jugs that are 90% water? Our washer machines actually use water to clean the clothes. Why do we do that? I think it doesn't make sense environmentally. And EarthBreeze has come up with a genius solution, one of those solutions that you say, why hasn't everybody thought of this? But they did. Did you know that 91% of those jugs also don't get recycled. Yeah, that's crazy. This is why EarthBreeze is such a great product. And the clean that you get is fantastic. It works in hot water, cold water. It couldn't be easier. They're amazing. That's all we use now too. Why did someone not come up with this sooner? So EarthBreeze has just made the whole concept of detergent better. Yeah. And you still get a powerful clean for your clothes. And and here's the thing. If you try it and you don't like it, they will give you a full refund. You don't even have to send the stuff back. They are so confident that you'll love it. I'm pretty confident you'll love it too. It really is great. Can I tell you what I also love about it? Okay. It's a dryer sheet. That's all it looks like. You can stick EarthBreeze sheets in a Ziploc bag. And no matter where you travel, you always have laundry detergent on you. Isn't that genius? It is genius. Now's the time to try EarthBreeze. Listeners of Fluster Clucks can subscribe and get 40% off. So go to earthbreeze.com slash Fluster to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash Fluster for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash Fluster Robin, obviously I'm a fan of therapy. The research is pretty darn clear that when you're having either small, normal life difficulties or when you're really in a crisis, having somebody who is skilled and capable and trained to talk you through it, to help you problem solve, is really incredibly effective as you manage your life. Well, a lot of people have challenges with accessibility and affordability of therapy, but that's why Talkspace helps on both accounts. Talkspace, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. And there's no need to commute to appointments or miss times at work or line up childcare because you can attend your sessions from your phone, from your laptop. It's mental health care made easy. Yeah, it's the number one online therapy platform. There are licensed therapists in over 40 specialties. These include anxiety, depression, substance use, relationship issues, and more. It's secure and private. It's using the latest end-to-end bank-grade encryption technology, which is a fancy way of saying it keeps your information private. It's in-network with most insurers. So as a listener of this podcast, and we know you listeners are very interested in improving your mental health and your relationships, you will get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $100 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. Okay, so now back to the show. All right, so let's talk about teens and phones and loneliness. Boom, boom, boom. It's a big deal. So let me start off by saying that I am not in the camp, although I wish I could be in the camp because it would make my life easier, but I'm not in the camp where I say, oh, phones are terrible, kids shouldn't be on phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's more nuanced than that. And I know that phones aren't going anywhere and I know that they serve a purpose and there's a lot of convenience to them. Being actually somebody whose husband doesn't have a cell phone, I can absolutely understand how convenient it is sometimes for your partner to have a cell phone. Okay. That said, what we want to pay attention to is there's a lot of research coming out. There's a lot of information about the impact of social media on kids and teens and loneliness. And a lot of this stems from the pandemic. One of the things that is clear is that even though 
social media can have its place. And even though there are some positives to it, the overall message is that even though some social media is helpful and we can have experiences that are connective, make us feel better about ourselves and the world, et cetera, et cetera. When we look at the overall research about teens and social media, the numbers do not say that it's a great thing. The numbers say that it's something that we really need to be paying attention to with our teens and that the use of social media overall contributed to loneliness in teenagers, particularly during the pandemic. So social media use contributed to the loneliness of teenagers particularly during the pandemic, but probably it's not going to change that much. And the numbers did go up during the pandemic. And I haven't seen anything that's saying that they're going down dramatically. When a teen is just like scrolling through social media as a passive observer of looking at short, funny videos or whatever, that's the majority of the usage. Of course, there are teens who are creating that content, which is usually like, we're going to do a dance together or we're going to create this funny skit. So that's like slightly more positive social media because you're in a creation role. You're in an active role with it. But that's a very tiny percentage of people using social media in that way. It is this passive experience that's taking up the time from something that's far more likely to contribute to better habits, connection, academics or hobbies, skill building, and all of these other ways. Yes. And the other thing too, though, is that you say that they're like scrolling through and looking at funny videos. Yes. I mean, I think it's like the grownups that are watching more of the golden retrievers carrying kittens around. What teenagers get exposed to is the videos that really set them up for social comparison. Yeah. I was just about to say, Because it's making also these content creators are creating these things where then the social comparison then comes in and says, you're sitting here alone in your room like a loser and not doing these great things. Correct. And it was interesting because during the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that teenagers said is that they were doing social media less during the beginning of the pandemic. I think because they didn't have anything to post, right? They're like, okay, so I made another sandwich. But the social comparison of social media with kids, it's a way for them to feel lonely. Because remember, loneliness is the perception of there's a gap between what I want and what I have. And social media is all about making it look like what you have is better than what everybody else has. I mean, that's not all social media is, of course. But teenagers are posting in a way to say, look what I'm doing, look where I am. Look who I'm with. Look who I'm with, exactly. And so if you are scrolling, particularly, and I wonder, I haven't seen research about this, and I wonder, my friend, colleague Deborah Heitner has a new book coming out about social media use. I I bet she's going to address this because she's so on with this topic. But I wonder what the difference is when you're scrolling and looking at social media of people that you kind of know versus the way that I look at it, where I'm just sort of scrolling and looking at golden retrievers carrying kittens around. That if you know these people, if you have some sort of connection or some sort of knowledge of them, how much worse does it make you feel versus when you're looking at strangers? So if you're looking at people that you know, because we grew up in a time before social media, I want you to pretend that you're 28 years old again and you've gotten like an alumni magazine from your high school. (laughs) Yeah, right. Right. Who got married? Who's having kids? You know, whatever. Who filed a patent and has launched a company, right? So we have had that kind of social comparison experience for a while. And then with online, you can just have it quickly all the time. Yeah, because our social comparison experience, how often does the alumni magazine come? And then you go to your reunion, your college reunion once every five years. Right. And so we used to have to deal with that stuff much less. Loneliness is such a feeling of being left out, right? It's such a feeling of not knowing how to be included. As I said before, it's just such a feeling of longing. So when kids are on social media, when teenagers are on social media, and they're watching what everybody else is doing, it is a dose of longing and wishing and feeling left out over and over and over again. It's intense. And remember, too, that it's that perception of 
it's easier for everybody else. Why is it so hard for me? And that's really what pulls kids down is this idea that everybody else is doing it but me. A way to think of it is if what's wrong with me, everybody else is connected but me is a natural state for teenagers and adults. That's a timeless dynamic. But then you add a smartphone with social media apps. It's like a stick of dynamite. You're handing that person to experience those feelings at a much greater intensity. Gosh, it was a long time. My kids were little, but I was invited to this New Year's Eve party year after year. And then that one time I didn't get the invitation. We didn't get the invitation and I called you crying. I do remember. I remember where I was sitting in my old house when you called me. I remember where I was sitting when I called you too at the top of my staircase. And so it just was, and I was a grown up. I was a professional. I had two kids and the sense of loneliness. And also just by the way, I hate New Year's Eve, <laughs> but the fact that I wasn't included and God, can you imagine this was before we all had smartphones? I guess I didn't have one, but if I had looked at pictures and seen everybody around that table, the only thing actually, the way that I got myself to sort of be okay with that is that I sort of decided that maybe they just didn't have the party that year. And then about eight months later, I was with these people in another situation and somebody mentioned the party that they had had that year. So I knew that they had had it and it just all came crashing back again. And I am saying this as like, seriously, everybody, I have pretty solid self-esteem and I have a lot of amazing friends and I don't feel lonely chronically. I don't. But I just remember that experience. And I think that me having that experience, when I sit and listen to these young people talk about how they feel left out, maybe, you know, I pull that up. It, it allows me to be empathic. But it just, man, it just hurts my heart when I hear people talk about being lonely. If you haven't listened to the episode on school avoidance that we have recorded, I talk a lot in that episode on school avoidance about connection and how parents can help. So there's going to be more information in that too, if you've already listened to it. Because really, I mean, as you can gather, as we're dealing with all of these things with our kids and people are so alarmed about depression and anxiety and what's going on with our kids, for me, it just keeps coming back over and over and over again to how do we foster genuine connection. And I know that's something that's so important to you, Robin, too. We just talk about it all the time. I just don't feel like I can talk about it enough at this point. How do we foster genuine connection? If 68% of adults are reporting that they feel lonely, then it's not a small problem. And so it becomes something that we can all talk about. We're not talking about a little tiny group of people. We're talking about a large majority of people living adult lives feeling disconnected. Yeah. My husband grew a mustache during COVID. It was more than a mustache. He is telling me right now that he's going to shave it off. I can't wait until he gets rid of the mustache. I was talking about it yesterday at the conference because I had to introduce him to everybody. There's 270 people. And I say, the guy in the back, the one with the Hulk Hogan mustache, that's my <laughs> husband. And then I had to put a disclaimer. I just want you all to know I don't endorse the mustache. Yeah. So I'm only putting that out there because... It's just got to go. So I'm going to keep you posted. Did he say, I'll get rid of it when X happens? He said this summer. Oh, yeah. So I know your husband and that could mean until. It could be the summer of 2028, right? But yeah, it's got to go. No, he'll be like, we have not had the fall equinox yet. Yeah. I don't know. Like maybe some of you are out there. Maybe some of you have husbands that have mustaches. Does anybody like it? Does anybody enjoy the mustache? I just don't. I think a lot of women actually might just because the beard and the mustache are such a thing now, right? I mean, it's a thing. Well, the beard and the mustache, I guess, is better than the mustache. He came in this morning. I was in here. I'm in my office. He came in this morning. He's talking to me about something. And he has this drip of coffee hanging off his mustache. 
I couldn't listen to a word he was saying because I was just completely focused. For some reason, I thought you were going to say he was eating a bowl of cereal and (laughs) drips of white milk were dangling from his mustache. Yeah, no, that's probably happened too. But it was like Roseanne, Roseanne and Dana, like she's got a sweat ball hanging off the end of her nose. It was, I just can't stand it. So anyway, for those of you who have a husband who has a mustache and you hate the mustache, we can form a group. If you're lonely in that feeling of having a husband that has a mustache and you hate the mustache, you're not alone. We can start a separate sub thread in the Facebook group for (laughs) women needing support of unwanted mustaches in their lives. Man, oh man. All right. Well, I'll keep you posted. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn.